Welcome to Cool Voodoo, the sorcery of copper. In this episode, I will talk about how to identify electronic components. Whenever you want to find out how an electronic board works, you have to remember how they are made. First, you have all the electronic components which have different functions. We have a connector, microcontroller, button switches, a crystal. And then there's a printed circuit board. The board allows you to think that it's a rigid substrate where you can place all the components on. And then there's a sheet of copper on top of it. This is the light green, which you can see. And it allows you to, co to, to connect all the components between each other. Here we can see, for example, from this microcontroller, there's these leads are connected to the copper here, and then there's a trace going to this component with the capacitor. So just by visually looking at the copper traces, which you can see, you can know how the components are connected together. On very simple boards, you have only one layer of copper and it's very easy to see where the connections are. But on a bit more advanced boards, you have two layers, one on the back and one on the front. And you can even interconnect the two layers. For example, let's look at this LED. Um, here there's a connection to this round via. What this via allows you is to interconnect to the other side. Here we come the connection is made here. We can continue to trace along this path and then we have a via again here. So we turn over and we can see this via connects to this microcontroller, to these leads on this microcontroller. Um, so now we can see how we can trace, the, how we can find how the components are connected just by visually looking at the traces. Um, some traces may be hidden be behind chips, but most of them you, you can see it from, from the outside. But they're even more complex board, like this netbook motherboard, where we have one layer on the front, one layer on the back, components on both sides. But we also have layers in between these two layers. So even if you can trace paths, which we can visually see because of the light copper on one side, on the other, we have no idea how the copper paths are done and how the routing is done in between. And even worse, if you look here, we have lots of very tiny vias, and on the other side, we don't have that many of these tiny vias. So it means that the vias don't go from one side to the complete other side, but they are micro vias or buried vias. They just go from one layer to any other layer. And then there's even more routing. So this makes it quite complicated to visually route and to find out how components are connected from one to the other. But in this case, you can use the continuity mode in the multi which is denoted by this audio signal. Let's switch to it. Here we have the audio signal again. And what happens is, if you short the lead, there will be a beep. So now we can trace which lead is connected to which lead, so we can find out which component is connected to which component. For example, this lead is connected to this lead. Up again here. So whenever you have exposed leads, like here or like here, it's pretty easy to find out how the components are connected together. There are some packages or some chips where the connections are underneath, like here, there are tiny balls all over um, the chip, and there you cannot really probe with the multimeter. But at least with normal chips with the exposed leads, you can find out how they are connected to the other components. Now that we know how the components are connected together, we have to identify the components themselves. And this is where the white markings are quite helpful. This is the so-called seal screen, and this is where the board designer will put some textual information. So these small text markings which you see are reference designators. They usually start with at least one letter and end with a number. For example, here we have C505, T stands for capacitor, so this is probably the fifth, 505th capacitor. But you have also other markings, uh, reference designator. For example, here we have, it starts with D. D denotes that this is a diode. We have R for this component, so this is a resistor. Q stands for transistors, then we have U for microcontroller or integrated circuits, we have L for inductors, but there is no real standard to name all the different components, it's up to you. 
the one which I told you are the very common one like this one X for crystal but when it gets a bit more fancy you can use whatever you want and you will find different markings on different boards for example here we have CN for this connector sometimes you will find J sometimes you will find con sometimes you'll find P it's really up to the designer to use the reference designator they want there's a wiki page with a non-exhaustive list which at least shows you how the different kinds of markings you could use. You can also identify components based on the package. For example, this electric component, it has two terminals. It is black, it is flat, this is a chip resistor. They are very often come in this package. Here we have also two terminals. The body is a bit thicker and it's brown. This is a multi-layer ceramic capacitors. This package with three leads is very common for transistors, but it doesn't always have to be this way. For example, this one, it's exactly the same package, but this is not a transistor, this is a diode. That's what the reference designator tells us. And then you have these packages where you have tons of leads. This is a microcontroller or an integrated circuit, but something more complicated. And to find out what it is, we could use the top markings here, but we'll come to that later. Yet another way to identify components is based on their location and the components which are nearby. For example, on this chip, we have next to it lots of small capacitors. This is because when you have some kind of processing chip and you are working with a signal, you want to have very clear signal. And this is why you put bypass capacitors next to the pin. Um, this chip itself, this is probably some kind of voltage reference or power management. How do I know? Well, if we flip the chip, we see very big capacitors, very big inductors, we have large traces. So somewhere here there is some kind of power management or some voltage regulation done. Since this chip is here, this might be doing it, but this is just a guess. Now if you look at this chip, there are not a lot of other components next to it except um, some connectors. Again, if you flip it, we see there is a card slot. So this chip does some problem, some memory interface and it makes sense to put it next to the card slot because you want to connect all these pins to this chip. So it wouldn't make sense to put this chip on the other side of the board because then you would have to route all the signals over the whole board up to this connector. Mm. Here also we have an Ethernet connector and because we want to protect from the inside circuit from the outside world, there could be some kind of shock or so on. Generally, when you have an Ethernet connector next to it or somewhere around, you have some Ethernet transformer. And this is this package. It's very recognizable by the package, but also because it's next to the uh, connector itself. So, as when you tear apart products or when you design boards, you will learn slowly where to put components next to each other. And this is a lot of experience, like the packages themselves how the components are come in which package. This is also it has a lot to do with experience. So just take apart components and do a lot of electronics by yourself and you will find out. For example, also this, my, um, this is a crystal oscillator. So somewhere around here, there is some kind of microcontroller which uses this crystal oscillator as clock input. Now let's come back to the top markings when we want to identify huge um, microcontroller or huge integrated circuits. Let's have a look at this one. Up. On top you have the logo, the big A. This is the logo from Atheros, the vendor of this chip. Just under it you have even the vendor name, Atheros. Then you have the part number 8132M minus AL1E. And this tells us what kind of chip it is and what it does. And just under it, you have another number, BE9815B1. I don't really know what this is. It could mean several things. It could tell us about the options which are present on this chip. It could be some kind of vendor internal information or internal reference. It could uh, give some information about the manufacturing and so on. Um, below it, you have 37 uh, 0937. This tells us that this chip has been produced in the 37th week of 2009. It's the day code of the chip. 
and then in the end it tells us where it has been produced. In this case the chip has been produced in Taiwan. So this is quite an exemplar uh, top marking where we, you really have all the information. Um, if we look at this one, we don't have the vendor name anymore, but the vendor logo includes the name. So this this one is from Intel. Doesn't have to be always this way. Now on this chip, let me have make it visible. We don't here. Yeah, we don't have the vendor name which is in the vendor logo. We just have an I on the left, and this I, this vendor logo is actually from Intel also. And this is very known. This chip on the other side, it's not well known. We just have the logo, no vendor name, and then we have the part number SLG eight sp 13 v and if we look for it uh, if we try to find more information for example in Google or in any search engine we will find this this chip the vendor for this chip is Silego and very often the beginning of the part name um, or the parts number includes some kind of reference to the vendor so SLG is very similar to Silego but it doesn't have doesn't always have to be this way. If you look at this chip, we also, there's little marking. This is probably the day code, meaning it's been produced in the 45th week of 2009. Um, again, 2009, we find it on the other chip, so it might be the same one. We don't have the vendor name, we just have the logo. I don't know this logo. But then we have a part number, LFH84P-1. And this uh, if we Google for it again, we will find that the vendor is Lancome and the logo matches to Lancome. There are even some dedicated search engines to find datasheets about the chips like Octopart or alldatasheets.com. But actually I find Google to be the, the best search, in, search engine. So you just put the part number which you can read from the top markings and if you don't find the exact results immediately, you can still put a bit of information. We know that this component is a LAN Ethernet transformer. And generally you'll find uh, enough information. So put answer, we see there's, there's enough information to, to confirm our guess. Um, like with this, what another useful aspect with Google is that when you put the component number, you will have images corresponding to it. And here we can see that the Silego chip, SLG chip, which we found, corresponds to what we have. We can even have a detailed look at all the images. And here we see a lot of images of the chip and actually it corresponds. So it has the same package, TQFP, with the same number of pins. It has the same logo and almost the same marking. So this helps us to really identify and to be sure it's, it's uh, our own component. And if you don't have enough information, the vendor name is quite useful, but if you have only the logo and not the vendor name itself, there are dedicated websites like lnec.com, which has a list of logos. And so when you click on the logo, you will find which vendor it belongs to. So this will help you when you do your search for, for the parts. And there's also this, the second site, classiccomponents.org, classiccmp.org, um, which has another huge list of logos. But as you can see here, these are small uh, raster logo, pixel logo with not a high resolution. So what I did is I created my own page and here I put the logos on the chips I find where I tear down some, some components. And the difference compared to the other is that um, this is also only black and white because the markings are generally only white on the on the packages. But also here it's not a raster graphic, so no GIFs or no PNG. These are vectorized graphics. So whenever um, you can you can zoom as much as you want and the quality just stays. So what I do is I find the once I found who who the vendor is, I will try to find the logo or something which looks similar to the logo and vectorize the image so I can put it here. And this is a small connection I I did. You can find it on iclogos.covoodoo.info and you can also find the source code for it on git.covoodoo.info. And it's pretty simple. It's just one web page with a link to all SVG vector graphics.
And on some other electronics you will find this. So here we have again a package with the top markings on it, but here we have a giant epoxy blob. We know that it's a microcontroller or some kind of integrated circuits because there are lots of paths going through it. And the difference is that um, they wanted to save some costs on the bill of material. And instead of having the bare chip package and this kind of nice package with leads coming out and then you can solder the whole package on the PCB. What they did is they took the raw chip, glued it on the PCB directly, had some wire bounding between the chip and the path, which goes everywhere, and then you put a blob of epoxy so to protect, uh, to protect everything and to have it stick to the board. And this allows them to save some, some sense because you don't have to package the raw chip in an external package. They very frequently do that for custom chips, for example, for LCDs. Here we have the LCD, so this is probably the LCD driver. If we look at this LCD, we also have three times a raw chip, which is bonded, which has wire bonding to the traces, and then you put a blob of epoxy on top of it to protect it.